Food is something that people seem very conservative about. It's embedded in our culture and our traditions. There's a lot of conformity, I think. I wrote Animal Liberation in 1975 because I was convinced that I had stumbled on something that most people were oblivious to. The fact that the animals I had been eating had not had pleasant lives outside in the field until one final day they were trucked to slaughter. But rather, increasingly, more and more of them had lived their entire lives crowded into sheds, treated in ways that were obviously quite contrary to their welfare, just so that their meat, eggs, or milk could be produced as cheaply as possible. That led me to think about what is the moral status of animals? Are we really justified in treating them this way? And I fairly quickly decided that we were not, and that therefore the way I had been eating and the way the majority of people in the world were eating was really indefensible. I'm Peter Singer. I'm Professor of Bioethics in the University Centre for Human Values at Princeton University, and I'm the author of Animal Liberation Now. Upton Sinclair said, it's difficult to get a person to understand something if their income depends on them not understanding it. I would adapt that to it's difficult to get people to understand something if they believe their dinner depends on them not understanding it. So most people are speciesist. If you remember the species Homo sapien, great. You have rights, you have moral status, but if you remember another species, you don't have rights, we don't have to take your interests into account, we can do what we like with you. Most people say we're different from non-human animals. We're rational beings and we can think about the future. None of them can use language like I'm now using. So doesn't that show that we're superior to them? And of course, it does show that we are superior to them in our intellectual capacities. The question is, does that really determine what our moral status is? Jeremy Bentham, who was the founder of utilitarianism in the late 18th and early 19th century, responded to people who say just that and said, the question is not, can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? And I think he was right about that. If I want to characterize philosophically what I'm arguing, I would say we ought to apply the principle of equal consideration of similar interests. Any being with interests in the sense of being able to feel pain and therefore have an interest in not suffering, those interests ought to be taken into account and they ought to be given equal weight with the similar interests of other beings. So equal consideration of similar interests does mean equal weight for pain. Essentially, it means pain is pain, no matter what the species. We have to acknowledge the enslavement, cruelty, and effectively war that humans have been conducting on animals for a very long time. Let me give you three examples. The standard wire cage for egg-laying hens was one of the worst things that I came across. It's a really small wire cage, too small for even one hen to fully stretch her wings. And yet one hen wouldn't be alone in that enclosure. She'd be there with three, four other hens. So incredibly crowded, a miserable life for hens. Do the chickens miss scratching in the barnyard? Probably not. They have never known any other life but this. Secondly, for breeding sows, the mother pigs of the pig sent to market, they were confined in very narrow stalls or crates, so narrow that they couldn't turn around. And that's clearly a terrible life for these intelligent animals. If a person took a large dog and locked that dog up in a crate so narrow that the dog could never turn around, most people would be horrified. Maybe, maybe you would be convicted of cruelty to animals. But factory farmers can do that to millions of pigs and nobody bats an eyelid. The other concern that I have is in the chicken meat 
industry. So we're talking worldwide of 70 billion chickens raised each year. These birds have been bred to grow faster and faster. Nowadays, when you buy a chicken at the supermarket, it's been killed at about six weeks of age. Really, it's a baby, but it's a very big baby. They put on weight so fast that their leg bones struggle to bear their weight, and in some instances, their legs collapse under them. They can't move, they can't get to food or water, and they are just gonna die of dehydration. We need to allow chickens to live a bit longer in order to give them a somewhat higher level of welfare. That is, of course, if people are gonna eat them at all. If we didn't eat them, we wouldn't have this problem. The agribusiness industry justifies what it does by saying it's producing cheap food for people who want to buy it. And that has to be admitted is true. You have to point out that when it says cheap, it means the consumer pays less for it than they would if they gave animals better lives. But of course, it's, it's not cheap for the animals. It's not cheap for the local environment. Factory farms are major polluters of waterways. And of course, in one sense, they're not cheap for anyone in the world because they're contributing to climate change. The other victims are the workers. They're often immigrants, sometimes undocumented immigrants, poorly paid. This is a really unpleasant job. They leave at an enormous rate. In slaughterhouses, for example, the whole workforce is churned over within a, within a year. So there is, in fact, an immense cost for factory farming. The justification that it's cheap only works as long as you don't build those costs into the true cost of the product. If we did, we would see that it's actually a very expensive product indeed. In some parts of the world, there have been significant reforms and improvements made. I'm not saying that they're sufficient, but we have to acknowledge that some of the worst forms of confinement that I described in 1975 are no longer legal in the European Union, in the United Kingdom, and in some states, but unfortunately not yet most states, of the United States. And the interesting fact is, legislation requiring that animals have enough space to turn around or stretch their limbs exists predominantly in states that have the possibility of citizens bringing a referendum to vote on an issue. California is the best example of that. So California has had two separate referendums and both of them have passed very easily. So if you put these issues up before voters and you inform them as to how animals live, a great majority will say, no, I don't want to support that. I want to stop it. It costs a bit more, never mind. I don't want to see animals treated like that. There are some people who accept my arguments against factory farming, but say they still think it's okay to eat meat if it comes from animals who've had good lives. They call themselves conscientious omnivores. And I think this is a, a possibly defensible position if they really are conscientious about where they're getting their animal products from. But it's quite difficult, depending where you live. It can be really difficult to get genuinely animal welfare friendly products. I would question whether you can believe every label you see on a product that might say certified humane. Their food would be more expensive. Depending on what it was, it might be 20, 30, 40% more expensive, or it might be 100% more expensive. But I think that they would appreciate it more. Meat would become more of a treat, more of a special occasion. We could envisage a different society in which some people still ate some meat, less often, better quality, more expensive, and lived longer and healthier lives. So it is getting easier. I think that there is a good hope that we will actually make much more progress. And that's because I think we are going to be able to have the ability to produce a lot of foods which will be more closely resembling meat, but will not come from animals. I'm thinking here both of plant-based products, like the Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat, but I'm also thinking of meat grown at the cellular level, or cultured meat. 
which will be real meat, but will never have come from an animal and will have a drastically reduced carbon footprint. Look, there's plenty of great meals around. You don't need to eat meat. You don't even need to eat animal products. We've seen a lot more people going vegetarian and vegan. We've seen a lot more convenience vegan foods in the supermarkets. More and more restaurants have vegan options. And I'm hopeful that that will mean more people start to join. And if they do, it will get easier for others to join as well. Want to dive deeper? Become a Big Think member and join our members-only community, watch videos early, and unlock full interviews.